Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Library of Virginia. I'm Sandy Treadway, the Librarian of Virginia, and I cannot tell you how wonderful it is to have you with us this afternoon. This is the first in-person program we have held since March of 2020. And while we are streaming this program in order to make it widely accessible, it is a special delight to welcome a live audience back to the library. Yes. Today is also special because of the reason we have come together to commemorate the 50th anniversary of Virginia's current constitution. The library is the home of Virginia's official state archives and our government records collection includes the official copy of all seven of Virginia's constitution from the first one in 1776 through the constitution of 1971. Four of those constitutions are on display outside the lecture hall and I hope if you weren't able to stop on the way in, you will stop and take a look at them on your way out because we don't bring them out very often. Our program this afternoon is part of a year long effort to highlight the importance of Virginia's constitution and to raise public awareness of why and how it came to be and the significant role that it plays in our daily lives. This effort is being coordinated by a stalwart volunteer committee of lawyers, educators, historians, representatives from the governor's office and the office of the attorney general. Many of the members of this working group are here this afternoon and deserve our sincere thanks with special acknowledgement to Trevor Cox, who organized this volunteer group a year ago and keeps us um, on task. Also with us this evening are several distinguished justices of the Supreme Court of Virginia and a judge of the Court of Appeals of Virginia, representatives of Governor Northam's cabinet and administration, and at least one member of the audience who served on the staff of the Commission on Constitutional Revision more than 50 years ago. We also have a number of interns in the audience tonight, several working here at the Library of Virginia on constitutional related projects and others working with Supreme Court Justice Cleo Powell, and we're really thrilled that they could join us as well. The constitutional commemoration effort will continue through the end of 2021, and the URL for the website that lists upcoming events and activities is in your printed program. We can only do this through the generous support of many wonderful partners and sponsors. First off, I need to thank and recognize our lead sponsor for this project, the Virginia Law Foundation, whose support will in part allow for a significant legacy website to be created that will share not only the texts of Virginia's seven constitutions, but also the documents and articles that tell the full story of their creation. We are very humbled by and grateful for their support and belief in this project. We're also extremely grateful to Virginia Humanities for a grant that will allow the library to expand our annual Teachers Institute this summer beyond Richmond to have in-person institutes on the Constitution in Norfolk and Abington and also a virtual option for teachers who are not able to travel. Our other major sponsors include the firms of Hunt and Andrews Kurth, McGuire Woods, and Reed Smith. And Hunt and Andrews Kurth has a very close connection to the 1971 Constitution. Former Hunter partner Louis F. Powell Jr. served as a member of the Commission on Constitutional Revision, and Jack H. Spain Jr. served on the Commission staff. Trevor Cox, who's leading the commemoration effort, is also a member of this firm. McGuire Woods also is represented on the commemorations working group by Preston Bryant, who is the immediate past chair of the Library of Virginia Board. Additional support comes from Gentry Locke, Williams Mullen, Spots Fain, and McCandlish Holton. And I can't mention the last firm without reminding everyone that Linwood Holton, for whom the firm is named, was the first governor of Virginia to serve under the Constitution that we're here to celebrate today. So today's program is titled Looking Back, Looking Forward. 
It will take us back in time to reflect on what the Constitution of 1971 accomplished and why the transformation that it brought about in Virginia was so significant. But we'll also be looking at today and tomorrow. What is it that this remarkable document left undone and what are the challenges that lie ahead? Our panel this afternoon is moderated by A.E. Dick Howard, the Warner Booker Distinguished Professor of International Law at the University of Virginia and one of the world's experts in the field of constitutional law. Professor Howard served as the executive director of the commission that wrote the 1971 Constitution and he led the successful referendum campaign that secured its ratification. Joining him in the order that they will be speaking is Catherine Ward, class of 2022 at the University of Virginia School of Law, who has done legal and policy research for the Governor's Commission on Examining Racial Inequity in Virginia Law, among many other research projects. Next to her is Brian Cannon, an expert on redistricting reform and the former executive director of One Virginia 2021. He currently serves as the director of campaigns for the Institute for Political Innovation. And Henry L. Chambers, Jr., Austin E. Owen, research scholar and professor of law at the University of Richmond. Professor Chambers teaches and writes in the areas of constitutional law, criminal law, law and religion, and employment discrimination. And you'll find more about these distinguished panelists, more information in your printed program. We will have a question and answer period when the panelists have concluded. So put your thinking caps on and listen carefully. And I'm sure they would love to um, engage with you uh, in answering questions. And it is now my great pleasure to turn this afternoon's program over to our moderator, Professor Howard. Sandy, thank, thank you so much. I want to express my appreciation and that of the other panelists to the Library of Virginia for making this possible. And I know you're here because you're constitutional law buffs, but you probably also said, hooray, after this long pandemic, it's an excuse to get out of the house and go somewhere. So I'm glad this is where you decided to go. Um, I do see in the audience a, a handful of former students from one generation or another, and uh, I want to put you at your ease and say there will, there'll be no pop questions tonight, no quiz. You, know, you are free to learn something or not the way you see fit today. But this is a wonderful occasion to think not only about one constitution, the 1971 document, but about the place of the Virginia Constitution in the life of the Commonwealth, what it means to ordinary people, what it means to the rest of us. Um, we, we have a long constitutional history in this commonwealth. Uh, much of it we can be proud of and some of it uh, not so proud, frankly. Uh, it has had its ups and downs. It started on a very high note, the Virginia Declaration of Rights of 1776, which was largely the work of George Mason and his colleagues at Williamsburg in the spring of 1777, um, is one of the truly remarkable constitutional documents in global constitutionalism. It, was the model for uh, not only some of the other state constitutions and their bills of rights, but also for the federal bill of rights and indeed for the French Declaration of Rights of Man and the Citizen in 1789. So we really started in a pretty remarkable way. And th that document actually influenced the Declaration of Independence as well because it's, it begins with a, a very inclusive note. It talks about how it talks about the community, how government is instituted for the common benefit of the community. But then as it moves on to the question of who gets the franchise, who actually gets to vote, it's a little more qualified, a bit more tentative, because it says that men must have, to, and it was men in those days, of course, men must have um, sufficient evidence of permanent common interest with an attachment to the community. Well, of course, in 1776, that meant property holders. So as the years passed after 1776, one of the core debates was how and wh whether to enlarge that sense of who were really members of the political community. There were conventions in 1829 and 30, uh, 1850 and 51, and gradually the franchise was enlarged to the point where by 1851 it was essentially a white 
male uh, universal suffrage. Civil War then intervened, and then, of course, we get to one of the more remarkable chapters in our constitutional history, uh, the former Confederate states to be readmitted to the Union had to do two things. They had to ratify the 14th Amendment, and they had to write a progressive state constitution. Convention met in Richmond in, 18, in, in just 1867-68, and at the Capitol building uh, had a convention that included about 25% of the members were, were black, African-American. That was something that had not happened, as you can imagine, in Virginia before that time. And they wrote a progressive constitution uh, guaranteeing the franchise to African-Americans as well as to white citizens. They created the first public education system in Virginia at that time. So up, up to the end of the 19th century, the direction was largely progressive. That came to a halt in 1901, 1902, because after Reconstruction was over, the last federal troops left the South in 1877, then the retrenchment process began. The conservatives of that day, they couldn't go back to slavery. The 13th Amendment took care of that, but they, they wanted to turn the clock as far back as they could go, uh, cons consistent with whatever the federal constitution would allow. And so the convention that met in, in Richmond in 1901-1902 knew exactly what they were there for. They were there f under the banner of white supremacy. They were very open about it. If you ever run across a copy of the debates of that convention, you will not be surprised at what they said, but you'll be shocked anyway. It's, just, it's right in your face. They say the Anglo-Saxon race is here. We are superior race. We're meant to govern, and uh, black Virginians have no part of it. So they made it very clear they were there there to disenfranchise African Americans. Indeed, the chairman of the Franchise Committee at that convention, he was asked at one point, uh, won't this new constitution discriminate? He said, discriminate? What do you think we're here for? We're, we're here to, I mean, you know, it seems shocking. Today, today we would not talk that way, but they say they were very clear what they were about. And you'd say, well, where was the U.S. Supreme Court in all this? Surely they would not let this happen. Well, the convention delegates in Richmond that year had a green light from the U.S. Supreme Court. There had been a case from Mississippi, a challenge to the Mississippi post-Reconstruction Constitution, and the Supreme Court had said, well, it's, it's neutral on its face, and they wouldn't look at the question of how it might be applied. So the, 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 the template was there for the delegates in Richmond, and they, they used it, uh, say they meant to disenfranchise African Americans. They did that with grim efficiency. The poll tax, dollar and a half a year, doesn't sound like a whole lot of money today, but to a working man in those days was a lot of money. Then in case poll tax wasn't enough, they then had a so-called understanding clause. By the way, if you were a property owner or a Confederate veteran or the son of a Confederate veteran, you got to vote. Otherwise, you had to go to the registrar show that you paid your poll tax, and the registrar could then hold out the Virginia Constitution, turn it to any page at random, whatever section showed up, ask you to interpret that section. Well, I mean, there's some sections of the Virginia Constitution that I'm not sure I can interpret. <laughs> and, and the point was very clear. You show up at the registrar's office, and you're the wrong color. You're a person of color. That registrar is simply not going to be satisfied with your interpretation, no matter how educated you are. So you don't even try. You know it's an act of futility on your part, so you're not going to go there just to be turned away. Well, in 1867, just after the Civil War, African Americans represented about 50% of the voting population. In 1904, first general election after the 1902 Constitution, that number had plunged to less than 5%. So the delegates knew what they wanted and they accomplished it. Those of you who are longtime Virginians will remember the bird machine, the days of the early 20th century. That machine was founded on this constitution, a limited franchise, a handful of people who were really running this, the, the right kind of people were running the state. Well, that's the way things were. I mean, I'm a native Richmond and I was born and raised under the banner of Remember being tossed, talked about, talk, taught about the lost cause and the sort of moonlight and magnolias view of Virginia history. 
And those were the days, as I say, of the bird machine. That, that began to, to crumble in the 1960s. We had massive resistance, of course, an unhappy chapter in Virginia history. But in the 1960s, the Supreme Court declared one person, one vote in, in apportionment of state and federal legislature. The Voting Rights Act of 1965 was enacted, and that covered Virginia as well as most other southern states. Uh, the poll tax was declared unconstitutional by the U.S. Supreme Court. So things were changing fundamentally nationally and in Virginia. And that was the moment at which the governor, Mills Godwin, asked authority from the General Assembly to appoint the Commission on Constitutional Revision. And it was a remarkable commission that I had the good fortune to work with those folks. Lewis Powell, who later sat on the U.S. Supreme Court, Oliver Hill, who was the leading civil rights attorney in Virginia. He was the Thurgood Marshal of Virginia. Um, Colgate Darden, former UVA president, former, former governor. Uh, and so uh, Hardy Dillard, who later sat on the World Court at The Hague. I mean, a really amazing collection of people. They went to work, and they were the ones who, as I, as I would recall it, really had two missions in mind. One was retrospective, namely to put behind us the 1902 Constitution, to bury that once and for all, to make it clear that the political community in Virginia was not simply confined to the right people of the right color, that it was going to be an inclusive political community. So, the, of course, segregated schools went, the poll tax went, all of that, all that stuff had to, had to be set aside. Um, also, the commissioners wanted to be sure that we would not have any more Prince Edward counties. I mean, again, those of you old enough to remember the 60s will remember how uh, some localities in Virginia closed their schools, most notoriously Prince Edward, and it took a decision of the U.S. Supreme Court to order the county to reopen and fund its public schools. Well, the, the drafters of this present constitution did not want that to happen again in Virginia. So the General Assembly is mandated to have a system of public education for every school, child of school age in Virginia. And that's coupled with a mandate to localities, cities and counties, that once the General Assembly comes up with an apportionment formula, the local localities are constitutionally obliged to do their part. I mean, I read that to say the Attorney General could bring mandamus if a county didn't do its part. So that was the, that was the sort of dealing with the, the debris of the past, the unfortunate mistakes that we had inherited from 1902. Then I think there was the perspective part, was the forward-looking part of the Constitution. And I, I think if I could sum it up, it would be putting Virginia in the hands of its people that create a responsive government that reflected what the people of Virginia want and it enables them to do it. Because I hope if you take away anything today, it'll be realizing that as important as the federal constitution is, it's the state constitution that's much closer to the daily lives of ordinary people. And that's the, gov the running of government in so many ways depend on that state constitution. So I, I think it's fair to say that the 1971 constitution is one that is forward-looking, prospective, enabling of the will of, of Virginia voters. Now, is it a perfect, by the way, I, I wanna go back one step. After the commission made its recommendation, then the political process kicked in. The legislature, of course, had to receive and act upon what the commission did. The commission couldn't just promulgate a constitution. And, I had served as executive director to the commission. I was then asked to be counsel to the General Assembly. Well, as a law professor, I sort of went to Richmond with somewhat heavy heart thinking, oh my goodness, the politicians are going to mess, take these recommendations and mess it all up. I was pleasantly surprised. I have to say that the legislature rose to the occasion. I think they understood the common good, the common benefit of that 1776 language and they were able to tackle some of the political questions that might have been uh, tough ones. So it finally then went to the people in referendum. And Linwood Holton was governor by then, asked me if I would run the referendum campaign. Well, I, you know, I was a professor. I'd never been in politics. And 
But I said, yeah, I want you to see it through to the end. I said, yes, I'll do that. So I took leave from the law school and went around the state making speeches to any group that would listen to me, black churches, union halls, women's clubs, you, you, you name it, because I was worried about what today we call misinformation or disinformation. It was my first encounter with conspiracy theories. Conspiracy theories. The charge was being made that this Constitution was really dangerous because it couldn't have been written in Virginia. It had to have been written in, I don't know, Beijing or Moscow or, or worse yet, maybe New York or Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that wherever it was, it wasn't Virginia. Well, I mean, the conspirators, who were they? Oliver Hill and Lewis Powell and Colgate Darden and 140 members of the Virginia General Assembly. That's a, that's a pretty large conspiracy. But that was a sort of misinformation I had to try to stamp out as I went around the state. I love that experience because I went to parts of Virginia as a Richmonder I just simply didn't know when I was when I was growing up. Well, we must have done something right. We we had local campaign committees, billboards, all the rest of it. We got seventy two percent of the vote, which most folks in politics would be very <laughs> that would be a landslide, wouldn't it? They'd be very happy to have that. So it I think it had a very solid vote. So it went into effect on July the 1st, 1971, exactly 50 years ago today. Well, as I was about to say, uh, is it perfect? No, of course not. I think that one of the secrets of this Constitution and the process was the ability of the commissioners and the legislators in turn to think about how much ought to be done, how much could you do, what would the people accept? So there were some ideas that might have been good ideas, but just were not politically feasible. So 50 years has passed. Of course, we've discovered some things that might have been done better, some things maybe we do differently today. And I don't know, let me toss out a couple of examples. I think the Constitution is too severe in uh, restoring the voting rights of felons. Professor Chambers is going to tell us about, about that issue. I think the Commission could have done a better job on that language. Um, partisan gerrymandering, which Brian is going to tell us about in a moment. Um, I thought we had dealt with that. We said that commission district lines had to be compact and contiguous. Now, that's not self-defining, but it gives you a picture of what they should look like. Well, uh, the judges, understandably, on the Supreme Court are very sort of reluctant to get into the business of second-guessing the legislature on districting. So as you now know, I'm sure we have today a bipartisan half-citizens, half-legislators commission to undertake. We'll see how that works out. We hope that works out well. Other issues, Dillon's rule is still in effect in Virginia. Localities are only have the powers explicitly given them by general law. I think we ought to revisit that. Um, should the governor be limited to one term? We're the last state in the country that has that rule. I mean, I can think, you, you in the audience, I know there are a lot of folks here who really know this stuff, and you may have some other things you want to talk about during the Q&A session, but um, I think we're open to, look, I have tenure at the University of Virginia, you can ask me, and they, they can't take my job away if I give a bad answer to your question, but I'm so glad you all are here. I think this is a wonderful chance for you to think personally about the Virginia Constitution, about the meaning of civic responsibility, of goods, of citizenship, and maybe you'll go out, you know, during the next weeks and months and maybe ask a question or two of your friends and neighbors. So again, thanks to the Law Library for making this possible. Thank you so much, Professor Howard. This afternoon, I will be speaking about Article 8 of the Virginia Constitution, which outlines the state state's education-related responsibilities. First, for a bit of background, it is worth noting that Article 8, Section 1 sets a goal for the legislature to ensure everyone in Virginia's political community can access high-quality educational programming. Section 1 also mandates that no matter what steps a locality may take, the, the General, General Assembly <clears throat> must ensure that public schools operate in each of the Commonwealth's counties and cities. Complementing this language, Section 2 mandates that localities provide their share of financial support to public schools as determined by the Assembly. Further, 
Section 3 requires the General Assembly to provide for compulsory education rather than merely authorizing it to do so. With that background in mind, I will first describe the goals for increasing high quality education for all children in the Commonwealth that the Commission for Constitutional Revision embedded in Article 8 when creating the 1971 Constitution. Then I will discuss educational inequities present in Virginia today and relay methods for overcoming them. The Commission understood Virginia's history of recognizing education as a value of the Commonwealth. For example, they chose to adopt Thomas Jefferson's language in the Bill of Rights to enshrine education as a fundamental right in Virginia. However, as Professor Howard mentioned, the Commission also recognized that the previous Constitution, the Constitution of 1902, had a dark history related to school desegregation, and they created new constitutional proposals accordingly. After Brown v. Board of Education declared segregated schools unconstitutional, Virginia entered a period of massive resistance to school desegregation, through which the Virginia Supreme Court upheld public schools closing and state tuition grants supporting white children in attending private segregated schools. Based on experiences during massive resistance, the Commission sought both, one, to ensure that Commonwealth schools could not close under the new Constitution, and two, to avoid judicial interference in educational provision. The framers, as Professor Howard mentioned, also put forward prospective provisions. In relation to education, the Commission recognized that as a result of Virginians becoming more mobile, one, each child's education had become a statewide concern in addition to being a local concern, and two, urbanization had increased the gap in localities' ability to pay for good public schools. Attempting to solve these concerns and increase equitable school funding, the Commission tied funding from the legislature and localities to Standards of Quality, or SOQ, to be set by education policy experts in the Board of Education and approved by the Assembly, popularly elected Virginians. Tying education funding to standards of quality complemented Section 1's goal for the legislature of ensuring that educational programming of high quality is established and continually maintained. The Commission believed SOQ determinations require administrative expertise. They viewed the Board of Education a group of apolitical policymakers as capable of handling educational issues that could be emotionally charged, unlike the Assembly. However, as the Assembly would be responsible for financing the statewide standards, the Constitution authorized the state legislature to revise and approve the board's proposed standards. Despite these prospective goals, Virginia has yet to achieve educational equity. Article 8 may have successfully foreclosed opportunities for massive resistance, meeting framers' retrospective goals, but it was never meant to integrate schools. With no constitutional mandate to prioritize racial or socioeconomic integration, the number of highly segregated, high-poverty schools in the Commonwealth has nearly doubled in the past 20 years. As research indicates diversity is key for quality education, this bodes poorly for Virginia students' educational success and hinders Article 8, Section 1's goal for the, for the Assembly of ensuring quality education for all students in the Commonwealth. Further, Virginia has failed to meet the framers' prospective goals. Virginia is one of just six states in which the wealthiest school divisions receive more funds than the poorest. In addition to an inequitable funding scheme, Virginia is among the top 10 worst states nationally for state level contributions to education. This furthers funding inequities because local funding depends on property values. And due to historic racial zoning supported by the federal, state, and local governments in Virginia, <coughs> minority students commonly attend schools with lower property taxes, prompting them to have, on average, less resourced schools. There are three primary reasons for the Constitution's failure to sufficiently increase educational equity in Virginia. First, the legislature has historically provided inadequate funding for supporting the SOQ it adopts. Second, by the mid-1970s, the Attorney General described that the Constitution put forward only a goal for high-quality educational programming, not a mandate. 
so the governor could pull funding from the SOQ, even if that meant funds were incapable of actually meeting the SOQ. Third, the assembly has limited the Board of Education's constitutionally enshrined power, and thus the framers' intention that educational policy would stem from experts, as the assembly often fails to defer to the board's expertise. A constitution cannot self-execute quality education, but it can create governmental structures and goals to support all children in accessing quality learning opportunities. To do so, first, changes to the state educational funding formula are necessary, so educational quality does not depend on the size of a community's tax base. The state must adopt need-based allocations instead of relying heavily on student enrollment in funding allocation formulas. Doing so could adjust per student funding based on factors such as economic status and English language proficiency, which many states already do. Uh, altering Virginia's school funding formula in this manner could ensure that equitable funding would not depend on an annual allocation. Further, Amending Article 8, Section 2 to require the legislature to provide for the equitable apportionment of funds for meeting the SOQ could require that long-term funding equity must be maintained. Second, to promote racial and socioeconomic diversity, the full constitutional powers of the Board of Education must be restored. Then, the board should redraw the school attendance boundaries and amend the state accreditation process to both incentivize integration and penalize segregation. A Virginia statute currently preserves school district lines from the 1970s, effectively maintaining segregation that was created when families moved to the suburbs during white flight. By repealing this statute, the Board of Education could draw school division lines that promote the realization of the prescribed standards of quality, which the board is required to do under Article 8, Section 5A. With full constitutional powers restored, the board should redraw school attendance boundaries, and officials can consider an individual student's socioeconomic status and educational achievement, as well as neighborhood demographics when redrawing these attendance lines. Further, the Every Student Succeeds Act, the current iteration of the federal education law, authorizes the board to set the state accreditation process. The board should add a diversity metric to state accreditation standards. Doing so could hold schools accountable in increasing integration and promoting the value of diversity by requiring them to publicly report every two years for school accreditation, their racial and socioeconomic makeup, curricular representations of diversity, and professional development emphasizing culturally responsive pedagogies. Finally, the political process inherent to constitution making in Virginia could support increased educational equity. The drafters spearheading Article 8 did not support mandatory integration. Many today still oppose it. To overcome such opposition, akin to the 1971 referendum's political campaign for a new constitution, bipartisan local and state leaders must champion the value of integrated schools for students' educational success in the Commonwealth's and the Commonwealth's long-term economic success. They could do so through promoting an amendment to Article 8, Section 1's mandate for the legislature, requiring the assembly to provide for desegregated free public elementary and secondary schools. It is past time to support constitutional language, supporting diverse, equitably funded schools in order to prepare future generations of Virginians for success in free government. Even if unsuccessful, proposing amendments such as those discussed could spur conversation surrounding the Commonwealth's values and turn public attention to how to overcome continued segregation and funding inequities in Virginia. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, it, it is so lovely to be at an in-person event. Um, uh, Sandy and your team, thank you so much uh, for this. And I know all the volunteers that have been working on this. Um, and Professor Howard, this is an honor. It's an honor to be here with, with the, all the panelists, but uh, it's, it's a real honor for to be asked by Professor Howard to do this. Um, I'll say that um, 
Professor Howard is someone who not only made, uh, had a significant role in, there were other people who did, uh, but made this constitution clear that we have in Virginia. It made it smart and it moved us forward a, 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 a very long way. Um, but what probably is most impressive to me is that he wrote it in a way that was able to get the political support it needed to become the law of the land. Um, and I would, I would guess that 50 years later, we're looking in the rearview mirror of history, and we all think that, well, of course it would be successful, right? That it looks inevitable almost that we would, we would do that. Um, but as someone who just had a, you know, a, a role in getting a, a constitutional amendment passed on redistricting, uh, this past couple of years, um, none of that's inevitable. And let me tell you, there are potholes all over the road to success here, and it, it is it is all but inevitable. It is anything but inevitable. And I think it's um, it, it's it, it's probably hard to overstate that and the, the skill at which Professor Howard uh, navigated those those potholes. So, thank you and, and congratulations on fifty years. Wow, that's that's really remarkable. Um, I think it's also easy to take for granted in Virginia how, how clear our constitution is. And I'll tell you, the, the first time I read our state constitution, I was in college. Uh, and I was in the Sorensen Institute's program for college leaders. And, uh, and Professor Quentin Kidd uh, at, at CNU assigned us, read the constitution tonight. I thought, that is like the most boring thing you could hear on a summer, you know, fellowship, you know, really fun. Everybody's cool. It's your thing to meet. And, uh, and we all reconvened the next morning and he, he asked us, what did you, what did you think about it? And every one of us were, we were shocked at how clear, how understandable, uh, at least most parts, we had some questions of course, but, but how straightforward it was. Um, we certainly didn't understand the full context of what it was coming in on the back of he, uh, Quentin probably should have had us read the 1902 constitution first and then read that one to, to get the full picture. But, but it was remarkable how it was. And, and, and let me highlight this by way of comparison. Uh, in my current job, we're looking at other democracy reforms and other different states we could do. And I had to recently read the Nevada constitution. Uh, well, the part of it applying to election law. And, uh, I, I couldn't understand it to save my life. I couldn't tell whether to get an open primary system, we would have to even amend the constitution or not. Or even if we did have to amend the constitution, how does it happen? Because there's multiple tracks and it's the, it's the least legible thing I've perhaps read in law. And uh, so I called up a lawyer in Nevada and my first question to him after framing you know, my, our, our scenario here is, as I said, were they drunk when they wrote it? <laughs> and his answer was probably. And, and, then, and then he told me that this was done, and I think this is a fascinating bit of history, uh, the Nevada Constitution was ratified and uh, telegraphed to, um, or a telegram to Washington, D.C. just before the presidential election in 1864. Um, and they were trying to get their electoral votes to count, so they needed to get it. It was the longest uh, telegram uh, or telegraph ever sent. Um, and, and, uh, uh, at, that, at that time, and I think in today's dollars, it would have cost them uh, $62,000 to send that. So uh, not only were they perhaps inebriated, but they were also on the, uh, to, to get it through. So um, I think we easily take for granted how, how clearly ours is. Um, let me drive this to redistricting, because I, uh, I agree with Professor Howard that I think the um, the, the language that was in the Constitution before this amendment that just passed, which said that basically districts have to be redrawn every decade and they have to be compact, contiguous, and of approximately equal population. That seemed pretty straightforward to me. And if you've looked at a congressional district in Virginia or a state legislative district in Virginia, the first word that comes to mind would not be compact. Right, it's probably not the hundredth word that would come to mind when you look at those districts, and so we filed a lawsuit based on that. And I thought we had a great point because not only is it just obviously not compact, but these districts we, we picked districts that were both drawn by Republicans and by Democrats. So we weren't even making a kind of a political argument in favor of one team or the other. And you know, of course, the courts are sensitive to wade into the political thicket. And surely these districts would be struck down as not compact and in violation of the state constitution. Um, at least that's what I thought. Um, we lost. 
unanimously. So I was very wrong <laughs> uh, in that. But it taught me, and I think this is the point I would hope you would take with you. Um, I, and, and, and I think it's important to take with us as we think about reforms and more amendments to this constitution in the future, is that uh, the standards written into the constitution are not as important as the structure and the framework you put into the constitution. Um, so, you know, I, and, and I, I, you know, there's, there's a lot of important standards not to diminish those, but, but I think the structure really matters. And you, know, you could think about the, uh, the, the Professor Dick Howard of the U.S. Constitution, James Madison, is widely credited with the structure of that, and that's the genius in that. Um, but to put the point on it for redistricting in Virginia, you know, we simp you know if, if it were politically feasible, and it wouldn't have been, but if it were politically feasible, we could have written into the Constitution of Virginia in this amendment we just passed, saying you can't politically gerrymander. Right? You can't draw a district to benefit one party or another, something like that. There's plenty of language about that in other states that don't have to go through a legislature. Um, but that's not as enforceable as it would be to create a structure like we ultimately achieved in the Constitution, whereby you have an equal number of citizens and legislators on it, evenly divided by party, and you need, of the eight citizens and eight legislators, you need six votes of each block to pass a map. So that means at the very least, you need four Republicans, two, two legislators and two citizens, or the inverse would be true for Democrats, right? So you structurally end partisan gerrymandering that way. Now, that's not to diminish the other important pieces of this amendment, whereby we, uh, we, we you know, so we ended partisan gerrymandering. The whole process is now transparent in a way that it hasn't been before. And I think even perhaps definitely more important based on today's news from the Supreme Court of the United States, we added Voting Rights Act style language vis-a-vis uh, -vis redistricting into our state constitution for the first time. So another uh, major step forward for that. Um, so I think it's important to think about the, the structures we put in, in place for this. So let me talk for a second about going forward. How, do we, how would we go forward and, and, and improve this process of redistricting? Um, I'll, I'll tell you, it's no secret, we didn't get everything we wanted in this amendment, right? There was lots of compromises made along the way and, and, and structural things that I would improve. And the first thing, and probably the most important thing that we could do is get the eight legislators off of the commission. The commission itself is, is, is I think, functioning fairly well. And the, the eight citizens on it are great. We have Richmond's own Greta Harris. Um, you know, we've got some really smart, qualified folks on it. So uh, I don't think they need the legislators there to, to finish the job. Um, that wasn't politically feasible to get done, but perhaps it will be next. And here's why I hope for that, is because the two things that politicians cling to when it comes to opposing redistricting reform is the fact that they can, uh, they can screw over the other party and make sure their team wins, and that they can do it without anybody knowing about it. Right? That's been the history of gerrymandering in our, in our commonwealth and in our country and everywhere, and will continue to be in states that don't have reform this year. But we took away those two things with this amendment. Right? You cannot get a partisan gerrymander through this commission. Structurally, you cannot, or it would be really impressive if you did. Um, and it's all out in the open. So we have a transparent process that, that is, is designed to be bipartisan. Doesn't mean there's not other shenanigans that could be played, which is why I think you need to get the legislators out of the room uh, completely. Um, while we're on the democracy reform piece, let me also just say that I think there are some other important democracy reforms we could add to this mix. And in Virginia's law, we wouldn't have to make them constitutional amendments, but perhaps we should. First, I don't think the state should pay for party primaries. I think we should have open primaries. I would have loved to have had a ballot when I went to vote this June that had all of the Republican candidates for governor, lieutenant governor, attorney general, as well as the Democratic candidates, and have multiple of them advance. And then, and I think this is bubbling up in the conversation right now, um, is we should have ranked choice voting uh, in the general election to help us have, have more choices. And I think that solves the two problems you hear the most about our, our, our democracy not working, right? If, if the real challenge is, <clears throat> our, uh, is, is, is democracy versus authoritarian and which is the best system of government going forward, we've got to make ours work as well as we can. And I think too often you hear politicians say, who, are, you know, who if you just sat down and had a beer with them, you could solve 80% of the problems we face, but they can't vote for that on the floor. 
They can't vote for that on the floor of Congress because they're worried about being primary. So change the primary structure. Uh, and then too often as voters, we get to the general election and we see, these are my choices, this is it, and you're picking the lesser of two evils. And I think those two things can be remedied in that way with redistricting reform, expanding the voting rights that we, we, we have, making sure that those are going, I think that will put Virginia on a good course. And I think if you get those structural things right, then I think the rest of the problems we have, let's say education, right, and, and equity and funding for that, um, will we'll work towards a solution themselves. So thank you all so much for having me. I look forward to your questions and thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for having me here. Uh, Brian and I have, have had some, some fun tussling on redistricting, so feel free to ask us about redistricting later, but that's not what I'm here to talk about quite, quite yet. Uh, so uh, thank you all, all for the opportunity for for me to speak with you all today on this 50th anniversary of the 1971 Constitution. I have been invited to speak for 10 minutes about criminal disfranchisement and the restoration of voting rights of offenders in the wake of the 1971 Constitution. But before I talk about constitutional substance or constitutional doctrine, uh, let's think for just a moment about what the Constitution is. It sort of jumps off uh, Professor Howard's uh, comments a, a few moments ago. At its best, a Constitution reflects who we are and what we aspire to be. It defines what we want from our government, defines how our government will be structured and how the government will be run. At its worst, a constitution merely reflects the prejudices of the ruling class or those in power to draft the constitution. Virginia's 1902 constitution reflected the prejudices of those who wrested power away from people who had just been given a taste of equality after the Civil War. The 1971 Constitution reflected the desires of a much broader segment of the populace. Now, the more empowered a populace is, the more closely the Constitution reflects who we are or who we want to be. There is a wrinkle, of course, in our federal system. State constitutions reflect who we are but they must be consistent with the U.S. Constitution. Indeed, Virginia's 1902 Constitution was revised in part because it needed to be harmonized with the U.S. Constitution, given the changes to the U.S. Constitution and constitutional doctrine that had occurred since the 1902 Constitution was passed and amended in 1928. So constitutions record the people's thinking and rethinking regarding who they are and what they want their government to be. I think that background is helpful, if not necessary, to understand how criminal disfranchisement in the Virginia Constitution has evolved since 1776 and since the 1971 Constitution was approved. So criminal disfranchisement is prototypically Virginian. It's been explicitly noted in the Virginia Constitution since 1830. After limiting the vote to white male citizens of the Commonwealth who met other qualifications, the Constitution of 1830 provided the right of suffrage shall not be exercised by any person convicted of an infamous offense. After doing a similar thing in terms of limiting the right to vote to white male citizens of the Commonwealth of the age of 21 years, the Constitution of 1851 further notes, no person shall have the right to vote who has been convicted of bribery in an election or of an infamous offense. So it's getting bigger. Then, in a nod to the 14th Amendment, the Constitution of 1870 expanded voting to male citizens of the United States, sorry ladies, but excludes from voting persons convicted of bribery in any election, embezzlement of public funds, treason or felony, and persons who, while a citizen of this state, has, since the adoption of this Constitution, fought a duel with a deadly weapon, sent or accepted a challenge to fight a duel with a deadly weapon, either within or beyond the boundaries of the state, or knowingly conveyed a challenge or aided or assisted in any manner in fighting a duel. This is important stuff. Keep it in mind. Now, between the 1870 Constitution and the 1902 Constitution, a number of non-felonies were included by statute as bases for disfranchising folks. 
That then takes us to the Constitution of 1902, which expanded the list of crimes that would trigger disfranchisement even further, noting that the following persons shall be excluded from registering and voting. Persons who, prior to the adoption of this Constitution, were disqualified from voting by conviction of crime, either within or without the state, and whose disabilities shall not have been removed. Persons convicted after the adoption of this Constitution, either within or without this state, of treason or any felony, bribery, petty larceny, obtaining money or property under false pretenses, embezzlement, forgery, or perjury, and, of course, people involved with duels. So when we think about the 1902 Constitution, we recognize that we're expanding the list of folks who are going to be disenfranchised. Right? Maybe that's okay. Maybe it's not. Now, as was noted, it's still, in theory, colorblind. You can't necessarily see the color there. But in 1901, the Alabama uh, folks decided to draft a constitution that also was expanding lists of crimes that triggered disenfranchisement, and they did it explicitly to stop black folks from voting with the idea that, hey, we can convict folks of these other crimes and, uh, and have, have black folks not, uh, not be able to vote. Like I say, the 1902 Virginia Constitution did some very similar things. Uh, so uh, so we, can, we can pretty much see that they're, they're trying to exclude folks from the right to vote, and they've used felon disfranchisement to do that. So prior to the Constitution of 1971, the list of crimes for which disenfranchisement was a consequence was growing. Rather than expand that list, the Constitution of 1971 simplified it, noting simply, still in our Constitution, each voter shall be a citizen of the United States, shall be 18 years of age, shall fulfill the residence requirements set forth in this section, and shall be registered to vote pursuant to this article. No person who has been convicted of a felony shall be qualified to vote unless his civil rights have been restored by the governor or other appropriate authority. So Virginia's history of criminal disfranchisement is no surprise. The U.S. Constitution, in fact, allows criminal disfranchisement. Section 2 of the 14th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution limits how states can narrow the franchise, and in theory, it was, in draft, was drafted to ensure that black men were allowed to vote in the South in the aftermath of the Civil War. Nonetheless, the amendment states, when the right to vote is denied to any of the male inhabitants of such state being 21 years of age and citizens of the United States, or in any way abridged except for participation in rebellion or other crime, goes on. The notion is that the Supreme Court has taken that reference to limiting the right to vote based on crime to affirmatively allow states to limit the right to vote based on participation in rebellion or other crime, and arguably any crime. That is, states can disenfranchise offenders. It doesn't say the states are required to do so, but it allows states to do so. Given that Virginia barred those convicted of infamous crimes from voting even before the Civil War, maintaining a bar on voting for ex-offenders is no surprise. Now, Virginia constitutions have allowed criminal disfranchisement, but they allow Virginia governors to restore rights through pardons or through a restoration of rights process. However, the restoration process has tended to resemble a request for grace. Keep that in mind. In the last decade, the assumptions about when rights should be restored have arguably shifted. Governor McDonald began streamlining the restoration of rights process in 2013 for nonviolent offenders. The process continued to require individual requests and proof that restoration had been earned, but more nonviolent ex-offenders had their rights restored under Governor McConnell than under any of the prior governors. Now, not missing a chance to make sure that anything done reasonably small can be done extraordinarily broadly, Governor McAuliffe accelerated the restoration process substantially, <laughs> triggering Howell versus McAuliffe, a 2016 Virginia Supreme Court case. Basic facts, Howell versus McAuliffe. On uh, April 22nd, 2016, Governor McAuliffe issued an executive order that removed the political disabilities of approximately 206,000 Virginians who had been convicted of a felony but who had completed their sentences of incarceration for any periods and any periods of supervised release, including probation and parole. So the civil rights restored by the executive order were the rights to vote, to hold public office, or to serve on a jury, and to act as a notary public. He similarly issued additional executive orders in the following months covering those who had just finished supervised release. Speaker of the House and Senate Majority Leader sued to remove those ex-felons, ex-offenders who were registered to vote based on the executive order. 
from the roles of registered voters, claiming that that general that uh, Governor McAuliffe had overstepped his bounds. Basic decision that was put forth by the Virginia Supreme Court was that the governor does not have the right to restore the rights of ex-offenders en masse. Rather, uh, what the Constitution and laws of Virginia require is that rights be restored on an individual basis. Consequently, executive, the executive order was unconstitutional, and the remedy was that everyone who had had their rights restored through the executive order was stricken from the voter rolls. Don't worry, it happens in class all the time, just throwing the, the, the beeper down and we'll be fine. So in the wake of Howell versus McAuliffe, there was a push to restore the voting rights, and that push has continued to pace. Governor Northam has continued down that path, eliminating barriers to restoring rights and working to proactively identify ex-offenders who are eligible for rights restoration. Indeed, from Governor Northam's 2021 State of the Commonwealth Address, says the following, if you break the law in Virginia, you'll be punished. But right now, part of the punishment follows you for the rest of your life, even after you've paid your debt to society. You lose your civil rights like the right to vote, and you don't get them back unless the governor acts to give them back. Virginia is one of just a few remaining states where if you have a felony conviction, someone has to act to restore your civil rights to vote or run for office. It's not automatic, but it should be. I've made it a priority, restoring civil rights for more than 40,000 people, and I have pardoned more Virginians than any governor in our Commonwealth's history. But that shouldn't be up to one person, and you shouldn't have to ask for your basic civil rights to be restored. So I'm proposing to change Virginia's constitution to make the process automatic. If we want people to return to their communities and participate in society, we need to welcome them back fully. It's wrong to keep punishing people forever. This is the right thing to do. Now, to be clear, you don't have to agree with Governor Northam. The question is not what Governor Northam believes, but what Virginians believe, and what does our constitution do to reflect our beliefs and our values? So the question moving forward is quite simple. And it has to be quite simple because I'm out of time. So I'll, I'll, I'll beg your indulgence for one moment. What we need to ask is a fairly simple question. What do we believe regarding the disfranchisement of offenders? Should offenders lose their rights to vote? If so, why? If an offender does lose his or her right to vote, under what circumstances should that ex-offender regain their right to vote? Should it be an individualized determination or should it be automatic? In short, more broadly, what should our Constitution say about us? What should it say about who should have a say in government? Is it time for a constitutional amendment? I don't know. My fellow Virginians, you've got to tell me. Thanks. You can tell it's been a year and a half since we've done any in-person mm -hmm. programs because I used to always say, please silence your cell phones at the beginning and, and uh, I have totally gotten out of the habit of that. Um, I'm now happy to open the floor uh, to questions for our panelists. Um, we have um, staff members on either aisle. If you raise your hand, they will bring the microphone to you. And um, we have special disposable microphone covers. So, if you ask a question, uh, you will have a fresh cover on your microphone and you don't have to worry about, about that. So um, questions from the audience for this unique moment you have to ask the experts, yes. Hi, thank you so much for coming today. I'm so excited that we're in person and having this event. Um, Professor Chambers, I'm really interested in uh, disenfranchisement and in um, voting rights more generally. And I was wondering if you think it's um, appropriate to include um, taking away someone's rights, like the right to vote in a constitution at all, right? Not just under the circumstances or determining the circumstances in which we are, we think it's acceptable to do that, but is it acceptable in any circumstance to take away someone's right, right to vote or right to bear arms or any of the rights that are enshrined in the Bill of Rights or otherwise, right? Um, now I'm just repeating the word right. But uh, I'm, I'm just interested in this question about taking away other citizens' um, rights and privileges. Yeah, it, 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 is it ever appropriate? Yes, maybe. <laughs> the reason why I say it is that there, are some, there, there may be some crimes that are sufficiently tied to election law 
that we may say for those crimes, maybe we ought to take away rights just because we don't necessarily believe that the individual believes in what it is or what, or what matters in terms of voting. So, th so there may be some, some circumstances. In terms of basic felonies, I'm, I'm not sure about that. Part of it depends. And today is a really good day to think about this issue. Why? Because it's July 1st and various things, various new laws come into play. And some laws go out. Marijuana looks very different today. Now, just be clear, it's not my thing. I don't do it. It's not my thing. But hey, if you're up for it, go for it. Consistent with Virginia law, which is now different today than it was yesterday. So the notion that you would simply say, oh, if it's a felony, then it necessarily triggers disfranchisement. I, think, I just think we have to think harder about it. And we have to think hard enough so that when we put it in the Constitution, it makes some sense. It reflects who we are. Um, so I may believe one thing, but I really do ask, what do my fellow Virginians believe? And do we believe it deeply enough for us to say it needs to be enshrined in a basic document that we all have to subscribe to? Well, everyone in this room is going to have an opportunity to answer that question because the General Assembly has passed a first resolution to amend the Virginia Constitution to state that the right to vote is guaranteed, but that you're not allowed to exercise it while you're in, in prison or jail on a felony. So the question I would pose to all of you is, is that something that the members of this panel could support? It is a resolution that was proposed by Senator Mamie Locke. It's passed both houses. If it passes again in this coming session, it will be on the ballot in 2022 and we'll all have the opportunity to express our view as to whether uh, voting is, in fact, the fundamental currency of democracy, that it should be stated in our Constitution that it is a fundamental right. And, but disappointingly, the political process says, except that you're not going to be able to use it uh, if you're currently incarcerated, uh, either in prison or jail. But the good news is, is once you walk out, Nobody has to tell you you have your right back. It, is auto it, it, it will be yours again uh, once you're no longer incarcerated. So all of us will have the opportunity to both tell people who are running for election this fall that we want them to vote past this again, and, and then ultimately, uh, Professor Howard, to campaign <laughs> to get the constitutional <laughs> amendment uh, actually uh, accepted by the voters in, in 2022. So I, I hope we'll all think about that. Go, go for it. The question was asked of all four of us, so you should go first. Uh, so, Claire, I, I would look for the ACLU's position to be informed on this uh, to start with. Um, but, I, you know, look, I, I think that, um, that I would vote yes on that. I think it's, it's, a, it's a good step. I would be afraid to the prior question I'd be afraid to leave that to statute because we've seen what's been passed in statute that has been an attack on voting rights in the last couple of months that's just at, at, a, at an unprecedented clip that I'm aware of. Um, if you put the right to vote as a right in our state constitution, I think that insulates us as citizens from subsequent efforts to do that. And Right now, we have a very pro-voting majority in the General Assembly and a very pro-voting governor, and I'm very grateful for those majorities and, and uh, the governor. Um, but that's not always necessarily going to be the case, and I don't even trust it if Democrats stay in the majority that they would stay that way. So I think it's important to vote yes and put it in the Constitution and bank away that win and then work to get the rest of it done later. Claire, could I ask, add to that comment uh, a comparative observation, and that is the intersection between state constitutional law and federal constitutional law, that when I started teaching con law back in the 60s, if I were to ask to give an example of a fundamental right under the federal constitution, I would have said the right to vote. I'd be less inclined to give that answer now because Supreme Court precedents are beginning to slip away from that proposition which I would have thought was pretty fundamental. So what the federal constitution and the U.S. Supreme Court are not doing is all the more reason to do something in the 
Virginia Constitution. Now, granted, you put a right, we put education in the, in the Bill of Rights. I think that doesn't automatically create, answer the problem of equity that Catherine talked about so eloquently. But if you put uh, the right to vote in the, the Bill of Rights, it, it's a standard. It puts it there. That's a starting point. It means that presumption is in favor of the right to vote, and one should make a compelling case for any exceptions to it. So I think in principle, I'd be for exactly what you're suggesting. Yeah, I'll just sort of throw out one piece just to be a smart aleck because that's what I do, which is, so, so it sounds like what's being suggested is you do lose your right to vote based on committing a crime. And the question is just, do you happen to go to prison or not? Well, I'm not sure that that's fair. That is, I'm not sure that whether you're actually in jail or not should be the, the line. We ought to have a discussion about whether that should be the line or not. Right? Maine and Vermont allow prisoners to vote from prison. So if we want to have a real discussion, let's have a real discussion. Not one that just makes me feel good or that makes other... Let's have a full out discussion on this. And I'm not sure that we always do that with constitutional amendments. I'd love to actually have that discussion among the people of, of Virginia and see what, what happens. Um, let me just note one thing it's, that, that's it's kind of interesting. At least I think it's interesting. You may not think it's to terribly interesting. But the question of margins. One of the things Professor Howard mentioned was that this constitution passed 72% in 1971. And that's pretty good. And that's interesting because another percentage that we heard Brian, the percentage you noted was that for the Virginia Redistricting Commission, you needed 75% of the folks on the commission. So it's kind of interesting. 75% is really high, uh, as opposed to 72, which seemed high for a constitution, but not necessarily all that high for the, for the VRC. So in terms of what it is that we're going to require, uh, in terms of, of how we decide that we want something, is 50% the right number or is 70% the right number, 75%? Those are also questions we probably ought to think about when we're talking about putting a right into a fundamental document, regardless of how I personally feel about it. And if I could also just jump in and add, I think that in terms of putting a fundamental right in a document, questions about what structure we're giving to make sure it's being enforced and that there's no way to take things away later, I guess being at Brian's point about um, trying to keep certain statutes that we've seen in other states from becoming possible here. I know that, for example, in the education context, litigation in state courts surrounding the education um, clause in the Bill of Rights, putting education as a fundamental right, has been largely seen as aspirational rather than enforceable. And I think it's just really important to think about the structural elements that we might want to accompany such an amendment. So I think while I would vote yes on the amendment discussed, there is quite a bit more to do to give those structural elements. On the question of redistricting, we once thought that the compact contiguous language would prevent gerrymandering if it was uh, put into effect. But one of the things that has come from your discussion today is that we've gotten so smart we can get around compact contiguous without breaching compact contiguous. So my question is, is there any better language or better formula from any of the 50 states or any of the nations in the world that would lead to uh, a district that's not gerrymandered, but back to being compact and contiguous, but a, a better way to say it? Yeah, so I, I think that's a, that's a great question. The short answer to the, is there a magical formula that a math guru could come up with? The answer is no. And the people I look to at this, uh, Professor Boone Duchin, she's a professor at uh, Tufts University. She's an expert in this. She's wonderful. And she told me, Brian, we can't even rely on compact as the definition because there's 27 different mathematical definitions of that. Um, so, and further, I'm not sure compactness in and of itself is a good goal for fair districts. Um, I think what it's getting at is a good goal, which is we want to keep communities together so that they can elect somebody that represents them to go to Washington or Richmond and to do their bidding, right? That's the whole point. But th that's, you know, that the drawing communities of interest is like, you know, is even more, even, even there are more definitions of communities of interest than there are of compactness. So I don't think there's a perfect answer, which is why I think you need it to be done in, the, in, in full view of the public. Um, it will be the most, this will be the most scrutinized 
redistricting process ever in the history of the country because now the technology that the you know high priest of gerrymandering used to use to gerrymander our districts now it's in the hands of all of us right that you can go online and and draw maps yourself and uh, that evaluation process will help a lot as well as I think the balance on the commission. Yeah, let me add just a, a, a quick piece because we're doing one of the things that I one of the things that I do. Part of it is that there's no general agreement on what we really want done. So I'll just give you an example that I that I usually use with my students and other folks I run into. If you're going to draw a district, do you want the city of Richmond to be the district? Or would you want the east end of Richmond and the east end of Henrico to be in a district, west end of Richmond, west end of Henrico to be in a district instead? And the reason why I ask this is because that's just two different ways of looking at the same issue. Right? Where's the community of interest? It depends on what you want out of the system. And we don't have an agreement on what we want out of the system. So part of my concern is that we think we've done something by creating a new structure. And incrementally, it may be better than the structure that we had, but it doesn't solve anything until we as citizens sit down and talk to one another about what it is we want out of our legislature. We can't rely on structures to do that. We have to sit down and talk to one another, regardless of what side of the political aisle we're on. That's what it is that we need to do in order to figure out what should be in our Constitution and to figure out who we ought to send to Richmond or to figure out who we ought to send to Washington. If we're not willing to sit down and talk to people who we disagree with, we're not getting anywhere anytime soon. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. If there's one more in the audience. Yeah. Hi, uh, thank you all for, for presenting and for being here. Uh, I'm gonna, this is probably one of the harder questions, but uh, with the recent decisions in like Stoney versus Anonymous, uh, the Virginia Supreme Court has shown that they are pushing back on not having causes of action. Uh, are any of y'all concerned about the fact that constitutions aren't self, uh, you know, self-effectuating, they don't have causes of actions written into them, and what do you think that'll mean for some of the things you're proposing to uh, maybe put in, maybe with the education sphere and the voting rights sphere, and how would y'all get around that? I don't want to get too Fed courtsy, but you know. I'm glad one of the law professors answered that question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Go for it, or else I'm going to call on my friends in the front row from the from the from the uh, judiciary. What do you think? Yeah, go go for it, Professor Howard. Well, how how much time have we got? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, inevitably, the last question of the afternoon is the one that opens up a whole universe of problems. And uh, Catherine mentioned aspirational language. That's one of the problems. Is Courts like to talk about political questions. John Marshall used that phrase back in Marbury versus Madison, and what he really meant was what's appropriate for a court to decide. Some things are absolutely core questions, and what things are left to the political process. And that has bedeviled courts, legislatures, and constitutionalists ever since that time. Similarly, the whole cause of action question. Who, who has standing? Article 3 of the U.S. Constitution talks about case or controversy. It means you have to have a real, real case. And they're not going to answer sort of abstract hypothetical questions. Well, the Virginia Constitution does not use the phrase of, of case or controversy, but the Virginia Supreme Court over the years has sort of read, assumed that's part of the package, just as it is in the federal Constitution. I have to say that questions like political question, case or controversy, uh, cause of action, all those things are very malleable. And I think a lot of it has to do with the what's on the mind of judge. What, what do they think is the place of the judiciary in a democratic society? What it does is late, seems to be one of the fundamental ten tensions in constitutionalism, and that is on the one hand, you want accountable government based on the will of the people. That's absolutely bedrock democracy. At the same time, you want limits on what the people can do to trample the rights of men, racial, religious, and other minorities. And those two principles are always in tension with each other. So see, that's typical of the cause of action sort of thing. What, of course, statutes will have a lot to say about these things, but ultimately I think it lies, we, we finally trust judges to make these judgments on 
questions that are really questions of political theory and, and practice. Let me just add one, one quick thing, because I, I think that, that leads in perfectly to just a quick, quick addition. If the Virginia Redistricting Commission does not agree on lines, they will be drawn by the Virginia Supreme Court. I have the, the okay. amount. They'll be of, drawn by two uh, experts appointed by the court. Ultimately. They will be drawn so. by the Virginia Supreme Court because <laughs> that, they, they will be they will be drawn by the Virginia Supreme Court because that's what the Constitution says. Now, I have an enormous amount of respect for every member of the Virginia Supreme Court. It would be interesting to hear the justices talk about engaging in a practice that doesn't sound judicial at all. Uh, but it has been assigned to that group. Talking about what courts do, that's not what courts do, but boy, is it going to be interesting uh, to hear about it. And while, and while Brian is perfectly, it's perfectly reasonable to say there'll be, there'll, there'll be, two, there'll be two folks on, on both sides. There are not a whole lot of folks in Virginia who know much more about redistricting. And, and I'm not a whole lot of folks in Virginia who've done more writing about redistricting than I have. If I'm sitting on one side, and I won't be, and someone else sitting on the other side, there, there are going to be differences in visions of what redrawing the lines are about. And those will have to be decided by the court. That's not historically what courts do. That's historically what general assemblies do. But that's been taken away from the general assembly because presumably they've shown themselves to be unable to do so, or at least some folks have believed them believed the general assembly unable to do so. That is a structure of government situation that's handled by the Constitution, and it's a fascinating one. But hold on to your hats because this is going to be really interesting to see what happens with redistricting and whether we're going to get a better set of districts this time than we got last time. So we'll see. The last Stay two tuned. court drawn maps Virginia's had have been this past decade, and they've been really good. So I'm optimistic if that goes there, I think we'll get the best maps we've ever had. Let's hope so. <laughs> Low bar. Well, obviously, we could stay here all afternoon because these and, and what I hope you take away from today is the Constitution of our Commonwealth and of all all states is is so vitally important to everything that we do and something that we should be engaging in these um, th these efforts to understand it better and to make it better on a perpetual uh, perpetual cycle. So I want to thank our panelists. Please join me in thanking them for being wonderful today. And thank you all for being here as well. And I know that some of you are uh, probably staying downtown for another event that happens after this one. And I just wanted you to know you are welcome to leave your cars here if you decide to do that, but that our parking garage will close up at 7.30. So just be aware of that um, if you wanna get your car back uh, tonight. So thank you all for being here and we hope to see you again soon. <laughs>